The Health and Safety Work Act applies to employers, employees and extends to contractors, visitors and even members of the public. It's been part of our legal system since 1974. But how can one piece of legislation that was drafted over 40 years ago still be relevant in the modern world we work in today? So here we are in 2014 and it's been 40 years now since the Health and Safety Work Act 1974 came into force and um, you know has the Health and Safety Work Act been a success, has it changed things? Well I think really you need to go back 40 years and see how things were before, we, before the Act came into force. Um, Going back to the 1970s, we had the um, Employed Persons Health and Safety Bill of 1970 and at the time it was widely criticised because it didn't really address fundamental health and safety protection for the workforce. Um, as a result of that, a health and safety committee was set up, um, chaired by Lord Robins, and the output of that uh, committee was the Lord Robins Report or the Robins Report. Lord Robins was tasked with creating a piece of legislation that was not only simple to follow, but it also had to be flexible enough to be applied regardless of your size or risk. Everything from the self-employed taxi driver, offices and shops, and even high-risk construction sites and factories. Um, yeah, it's probably uh, also worth mentioning the speed at which the, the Act was developed and, and implemented. Um, in sort of 1972 um, when the Flixborough disaster happened which was an explosion in a chemical plant um, none of our UK legislation actually covered a chemical plant or even an office so it's again testament to the the, the act um, that it was developed in such a short space of time there are four main sections in terms of duties that employers owe to their employees or others that may be affected by the conduct of their undertaking. Section two being the duty of the employer to all of its employees. Section three is the duty that the employer owes to any other person other than an employee who may be affected by the conduct of their undertaking, including members of the public, contractors or any visitors to the premises. Section 7 is the duty that all employees owe to each other and anybody that may be affected again by their acts or omissions. And Section 37 is the duty of a director or a senior officer of the company um, and they may be prosecuted under Section 37 if it can be proved that the offence that the company commits was committed with their consent, their connivance or was attributable to their neglect. In order to determine how fit for purpose the Act still is, we talked to a range of organisations in terms of size and complexity about how they manage health and safety. We spoke to Keith Willocks, Domus Bursa at Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, who explains why complying with Section 3 of the Act is so important to his historic establishment. Um, the college operates um, with a large number of students um, and they're very active. Um, many, uh, the schedule of the college operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Often weekends are busier than weekdays, so there's a constant need to keep on top of health and safety issues. The college is located in the heart of Cambridge, and like any Cambridge college, we obviously have um, a large number of lively students um, studying, living and socialising in a historic location. Over and above that, um, out of term time and during vacations, we host a large number of conferences, we have members of the public coming through the college, we have tourists wanting to visit the college. So uh, throughout the year we have a large variety of people, we have contractors working in the college, um, a, a large variety of people that we all have to look after. Certainly with the students who are accommodated in the college, fire safety and fire prevention is a main, one of my main focuses and we spend a huge amount of time ensuring that we minimise that risk and should it occur that the students react in exactly the right way to an emergency. Over and above that, um, with the large number of visitors and tourists going through our grounds, 
um, in the winter particularly we have to make sure our paths and walkways are slip free if there's a da sudden downfall of snow we have to have a uh, regardless of the time of day or week we have to make sure our paths are cleared as legislation increases in um, the college will have to react by um, constantly upgrading its um, systems preventative maintenance in particular um, and recent work on issues like Legionella you know we're pleased to now that we're now in a position where we have a degree of confidence that uh, we're doing what's required by legislation. HSS Higher, a national organisation with a very different set of challenges, recognises that empowering managers has led to a vibrant safety culture. Phil Hemsworth explains more. At HSS Higher, um, I manage the safety team, um, covering just over 250 stores now and close to 3,000 staff. Uh, making sure that they've got the right to go home safe on a night uh, and the 250 stores um, nationwide now. Uh, Section 37 is quite important to us now, it's, it's making every uh, a buzzword in HS this year is accountability. So we're making every manager right from board level right down to the managers on the floor, uh, making them accountable for their actions or lack of. So you know they need to be fully aware of that they can be liable for any negligent or, or risks in the business that they're they don't see or, or fail to follow. Uh, it's at the forefront of every manager's meeting. Uh, health and safety is, is the beginning of every meeting. I meet with board level members weekly uh, to give them a full update of activity in the business, uh, additional risks uh, and things that we put in place to actually reduce those risks. Uh, we then uh, filter that down right through to all operational meetings uh, throughout the business on a weekly basis, monthly basis. Um, constantly putting different initiatives, method statements and everything else to just control everything that comes through the door to reduce the risks further and again in line with the uh, Section 37 of the Health and Safety Work Act is, uh, is constantly on our mind I suppose it's a very flexible act and uh, we make every uh, manager again accountable for that and they bring that down right through to the, to the ground level. Most of the managers there, the, the shops all do a, a self audit once a month. So there's a health and safety audit that they do a self audit every, each and every month uh, of overall 250 stores. Uh, the managers, again, uh, accountability is, is very in their forefront thinking and they challenge every member of staff uh, for compliance with PPE or working safely. Loading vehicles is a big issue in our warehouses, uh, it's a big part of our business now. Uh, is distribution, stock control uh, and transport. So all the managers, they're all empowered to ensure that um, all the drivers and vehicles and stock distribution people work safely uh, and accountable for, for all their actions. Studies estimate that now 27% of organisations undertake operations outside of the UK. Rob Greenfield shares how GSH, an FM company with an international presence, implements their corporate responsibilities when it comes to health and safety. We concentrate nowadays on uh, delivering facilities management and energy management services and that's uh, across countries such as uh, obviously the UK, Ireland, uh, Europe, uh, America and India. Um, as an organisation we have an integrated management system which is, which is accredited to uh, ISO 9001 for quality, 14001, all, all the normal accreditations that you would expect. But then um, we made the decision that we would actually implement that system, not only across the, the globe, but also the um, ethos of the Health and Safety at Work Act. So um, we, we actually use the Health and Safety Management System that drops out of the, of the Act and, and really um, everything is delivered to the standard of, of the UK. Um, that's not only our decision but also the decision of um, I would say all of our clients. Um, having carried out some work in Europe recently we, we carried out a gap analysis on compliance and um, legislation and we actually found that the UK was if you maintained everything to the UK standard it actually was better than what was required locally in country abroad. As well as containing duties aimed at employers and employees the Act also contains sections which enable the Health and Safety Executive to enforce and prosecute if necessary. 
So in order for the HSE to bring a prosecution against an individual or a company, they have to satisfy two tests. The first test being the evidential test, so is there sufficient evidence to bring a prosecution against that company or the individual? And when they satisfy the evidential test, the only thing they have to prove is that there was a mere exposure to risk. They don't have to prove that there was an accident or that the accident caused the injury or the breach. Just the fact that there was an exposure to the risk is sufficient. And as soon as they can establish that evidence, the burden of proof then moves to the defence, whether that's the individual or the organisation, to prove that that did, or that organisation or the individual did, all that was reasonably practicable to prevent that risk from eventuating. So in terms of where we see organisations fall down, organisations are very good at having health and safety policies and safety procedures in place. However, quite often there's a failure to adequately implement those procedures. So we see a lot of generic risk assessments, a lot of generic documents in terms of safe systems of work, but they need to specifically assess the risks that are specific and unique to their business and making sure that they're not just relying on generic safety documentation. And any failure to adequately implement policies and procedures could be seen by the prosecution or the health and safety executive as a measure to avoid cost and cut corners, which would then be an aggravating feature if the company was then to be prosecuted at a later date. So engaging the workforce is a vital part of health and safety compliance. They must ensure that they do that. Um, by engaging the workforce, it helps to improve the health and safety culture within the organisation so that health and safety is a living and breathing part of the organisation and not just something that management pay lip service to. Industry has changed dramatically since 1974 when the Act first came into force and so has the way people work, working hours and public attitudes towards health and safety. But when you look back at the numbers, over 650 people were killed in 1974 whilst at work. That number has dropped dramatically to below 150 in more recent years. There's still work to be done, but as far as I'm concerned, the Act remains as relevant now as it did back then.